Ah, turn with me, if you've got a Bible there, can you please turn to uh, the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 10. I want to read from verse 8 to 11. Whet your appetite a little bit. I want to ask you some questions. Get you thinking this morning about your life because it's your life. It's not mine. It's yours. And it's a gift from God to you, not a gift from God to me, although you are a blessing to me, but it's a gift that was given to you. 1 Samuel chapter 8, chapter 10, sorry, verse 8 to 11 says this. Speaking of King Saul, everybody know a guy called Saul became the king of Israel. He was leading the nation of Israel. He was under some instructions and Here is what the instructions were. It says, He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. So Samuel was the prophet of God who'd spoken to him and said, you need to wait for a period of time and then I'm going to come. And when I come, I'm going to do some sacrifices and then we're going to go out and we're going to win a battle. So this is what's going on at the moment. So he's got very clear instructions. He knows what he's meant to do and that is to wait for the prophet to come. He knows what he's meant to do, and that is to lead the army into battle, but at the right time, he's not meant to be t- making the sacrifices. It's not his job. He knows who he is. He is, in that moment, a servant of God. He's not God. He doesn't take charge and just do it. God has a way of it getting done, and he's a servant of God. He knows who God is. God is the one that he waits for. God is the one that he listens to. God is the one that he obeys and submits himself to. He knows all of this stuff, but watch what happens. It says he waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, being Saul, Saul said this, bring me the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. And just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. So isn't it funny, it says there that, 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 uh, that Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, it's the seventh day, and Samuel hasn't come. As soon as he does the offering, Samuel arrives. So Samuel got there on time. It it didn't say, I'll be there by 10 o'clock. It wasn't like today where he had his diary in his calendar and said, I'll be there at 9.40. And if I'm running late, just text me or I'll call you. He just said, I'll be there that day. And he arrived that day, but Saul couldn't wait. And so Saul went ahead and he did the sacrifice himself. And then when Samuel arrived, Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. And listen to Saul's reply. He says, when I saw the men were scattering, And that you didn't come at the set time. And that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. In other words, I'm looking, to start with, I'm looking at who I am. I'm looking at who God is. I'm looking at what I'm meant to do. My focus is there. And then you didn't arrive. Because we've got to lay blame when we lose focus, don't we? We can't just say, I just lost for No, there's always a reason why we lose focus in life. He says, I'm looking at, God, and I'm looking at what I'm meant to do and looking at who he is and my focus is clear. My role in the big picture. I'm the one that leads the armies of God out to battle. But when you didn't arrive, my focus shifted. And all of a sudden, I noticed that my own people were panicking and scared. And then I noticed that the army were getting confident and assembling together. And then I noticed that you didn't arrive. So I was focusing on God and I was focusing on what I was meant to do and who I am and who you were and then all of a sudden my focus shifted and I started noticing all this other stuff. And once he noticed all of this other stuff, it says, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. I haven't sought the Lord's favour, so I felt compelled to offer a burnt offering. Here's a man that begins with a very clear focus of who he is, who God is, and what he's meant to do. And then through an unfortunate series of events, which wasn't even a real event. I mean, Samuel did arrive, didn't he? He got there. But it just didn't happen the way he wanted. And so he goes from a man who's focused on who he is, who God is, and what God wants him to do, to a man who disobeys God. He loses his focus. He begins to notice what's going on out there in the world instead of what's happening with God. He stops looking at what God said and he starts listening to what everybody else is saying. My men are fearful, they're scared, they want to run. The enemy are amassing against us, they're going to attack us. And Samuel, you didn't turn up. So because I'm looking out there, because my focus is different, my thoughts change, and when my thoughts change, I felt compelled to do something that I probably shouldn't have been doing. Here's a man who lost his focus. And at the end of the day, it cost him big. It cost him big. 
We all know the story of Saul. This is the moment where Samuel comes and says, you know what, God would have, would have set up your throne for the ages. But because of what you've done, because of what you've done, he's going to have to take you out of the picture. What a sad story. Because of what he'd done. But what he'd done led to what he was focusing on. It all began with focus. It all began with what he was looking at. And I want to ask you a question today. When it comes to who you are, who God is, and what God's gifted you and called you to do, are you focused? How focused would you say you are on God's purposes for your life? How focused would you say you are on who God is? How focused would you say you are on who God says you are? How many of you know there are a million voices out there, particularly you young people? You know, God's got plans and purposes for your life. It's exciting to be praying this morning for Lockie. God's got plans and purposes for you. But how many of you know the world does too? And it's not just young people. As we get on in life, older people. It's amazing how many older people are getting, they're losing their focus on God and drifting through life. And I wonder how many people, 50, 60, 70, 80, they're standing there and they're looking back, going somewhere along the line, something changed. And now my relationship with God lacks energy and passion. I'm not doing the things that I felt like He's called me to do. And I'm not talking about uh, uh, what you do from a nine to five. You can do what God's called you to do anywhere at any time. You can be in any position, in any role, and do what God's called you to do. It's not about what you're doing or the clock you're punching. We all want a job that we're satisfied more by. We all want to do things that more uh, uh, allow our skill sets to come out. But the reality of the fact is, wherever you are right now, you can still be doing things for the kingdom. You can still be exercising the gifts and talents on your life in various different ways, developing your relationship with Him, understanding God better in the context of where you are, and applying yourself as the person God says you are to that particular place. It can happen for us all the time, but what are we focused on? I wonder how many people have lost focus in their life. See, I think this is one of the biggest problems with the world we live in right now is a lack of focus. We're focused on the wrong things. Now, I want to just throw some statistics and things at you at the moment just to take you on a bit of a train of thought. Next week, I want to continue on this path of talking about focus. But there's something I've got to talk about before we talk about focus. We have this phrase that we use. Anyone heard of the phrase time poor? Anyone ever heard that phrase? We're time poor. Anyone ever... Anyone ever uh, uh, Say, I can't pray because I'm time poor. I, I, I can't read my Bible because I'm time poor. I, I, I can't come to a, a gathering, whether it be here, anywhere, I don't care. I just can't get together with people on a, on a Sunday or I couldn't join a connect group or a small group because I'm just time poor. I just don't have time. Well, you know what? That, I've been thinking about this concept of time poor recently. So I decided to go on a journey and do some research about time. And here's a couple of things that I have discovered. I went back and I want you to put a picture up for me. I went back and I grabbed a calendar from the year 1971. So can we get that up there? The year 19... Now what's interesting about this is I didn't know this until I decided to go back 50 years. Did you know 50 years ago today, this year, 50 years back, the calendar was exactly the same? Who knew that? I didn't know that till I went back and looked at it. The calendar 50 years ago was exactly the same as the calendar, as in every day of the month was on the same day of the week. Isn't that awesome? 50 years, bang, here we are. But I went back and here's what I discovered. In the year 1971, they still had 12 months in the year. That's a scientific fact. I was born in 72 a year after, but I've done my research and apparently there, anyone around in 1971? Hands up if you were around in 71. Anyone? Yeah, can you verify this so that other people know I'm not just making this up? In 1971, were there 12 months in the year? Okay, next question. In 1971, were there about 52 weeks in a year? Okay, 1971, did a week comprise of seven days? Wow, I'll tell you what, it's worth doing your research. Young people, educate yourself. Look where I'm going. Did a day consist of about 24 hours? I'm getting a lot of yeses and a lot of nods. I hope you're all looking at the old wiser sages in the room because they know some stuff. Did an hour consist of 60 minutes? Yes, it did, exactly. Okay, here's another one. Did a minute consist of 60 seconds? Yes, it did. And guess what? 
Time has pretty much consisted of that configuration since around, I think it was 3000 BC, I think the Sumerians came up with the 60 by 60 by 60 time frame for a day and 12 hours and stuff. Around 3000 BC, the Babylonians adopted it and made it very, very popular. And it's been like that ever since. Now, just to verify, so you know I'm not lying, I went back again to 1921. Can we show the 1921 calendar there? So that's 1921. Amazing. You guys in 1971, did you know that in 21 the calendar was the same? Anybody here in 1921? <laughs> I didn't think so. But you'll have to take my word for it that in 1921 the calendar had, guess what, 12 months? How many weeks in a year do you reckon it had? Yep, how many days in a week? How many hours in a week in a day? Yep, exactly. You get the point. It was pretty much the same as what we have now. Now, here's an interesting thing. I've got a picture up here of the first ever official calendar. It's called the Julius calendar. Can we put this one up as well? This is the Julius calendar as decreed by, by oh, sorry, I went back to 1821 as well. Another 100 years. Let's skip that. There we go. That is the first ever official calendar. It's called the Julius calendar put together by Julius Caesar around 45 AD. Guess how many months were in the Julius calendar? Just have a stab in the dark. Have a guess. You're a smart people. Who said 12? Peter Felsch. But you're an engineer, so you probably studied that. Um, anyone else believe 12? Yes, it was 12. Guess how many weeks are in the Julius calendar? 52. So many days are in a week. Point I'm making is this. We've got the exact same amount of time that mankind has had pretty much back from the beginning. But here's something for you to think about. When you go back to 1971, I don't even have to go back to Julius Caesar. In 1971, let me give you a few facts. It took a bit longer to boil water. Anyone around in 71? Can you verify that? It was a little bit, bit, took a bit longer to boil water in 71 than it probably does now. We flick a switch now and it superheats and it's super this, super that. It took a little bit longer to boil water. Anyone have a bath in 1971 where you had to heat the water and put it in the, in the, in the thing? Did you ever have that? Exactly. There you go. What's a bath, he said. Did you know in 1971 uh, uh, it was, took longer to cook toast? And you go back even further, it probably took longer and longer to cook a piece of toast, to run a hot bath, to change a TV channel. Anyone remember the days where when we changed the channel, we had to do this. I'll, I'll illustrate it, the best thing I can do. Um, we used to be in a position like this and we used to do this. Click, click, click. Oh, wrong channel. Click, click. Bang, bang, oh, it's working now. Don't move, honey. Wherever you're standing, stay there. The TV's working perfect. Anyone ever have a house like that? And somebody would say, we used to have a TV and when I would stand up next to it, I'd just go near it, the picture would come on. And when I walk away, it would go off. So, so the joke would be, Alan, just stand right there and I'd stand in a position and my, my, my dad or whatever could watch TV while I just stood there trying to get a view of the telly. But if I moved from there, it didn't work. Now what do we do? Click, 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 click. It took a lot longer to change the channel on the television back then. How many of you know it took a lot longer to access information back then? Now what do you do? You could sit here right now and I could give you a question. You could pick up a phone and go to Google and you can find out information. If you wanted to educate yourself about something back then, you had to read these things. <laughs> this is a really funny one, kids. They were called books. Books, B-O-O-K-S. And they had pages in them and we used to pick them up and flick through them, and read them. That's outrageous. But you used to go to a book, and guess what? You couldn't type a word on page one to find it in the book. You actually had to go through the book and find the answer to the question. It was a lot longer, it took a lot more time to access information. Travelling the world, it took a lot longer to travel around the world back then than it does now. You can buy a ticket now and be on the other side of the world in, what, 12 hours or whatever. It took a lot longer to get around the world or to go somewhere if you go back in time. Do your shopping. It used to take a lot longer to do your shopping. Now you can click and collect if you want. You can just pull up in a car park and grab it and drive home and the whole shopping experience, you didn't even need to get out of your car but your car's full of groceries. Or you can just Uber and they can bring it to you. The point I'm making is this. Time has not changed. The amount of time we have has not changed. And life has become a lot quicker and more convenient. Yet we're claiming that we're all so time poor all of a sudden. Can anyone else see the logic in that? It doesn't seem to make sense. Here's the reality. 
Life's never been more comfortable or convenient and quick, yet we claim to be time poor. The truth is we're not more time poor, we're more distracted. Our biggest problem in life is not time, it's distraction. It's distraction. And I'm not just talking about these little technological devices that we have. We live in probably the most distracted age that mankind has ever had. And it's only going to get more and more distracting. Instead of sitting back and looking at life and going, if I only had more time, which you are out of control of, by the way. You didn't determine how many hours are in a day. You have no control over that. But you do have control over what you do in those hours of a day. And I wonder how many of us spend time on things that are purely distractions, that take us away from being who we are, from getting to know who God is, and from contributing and doing the things that God wants us to do with our life. How much of our life is lived with focus and how much of our life is pulled away with distraction? I don't believe in time poor. I believe in distraction. And maybe for some of us, we've just got to put a hand up and be honest to go, I do have time to do the things that God's called me to do and I do have time to be the person God's called me to be and I do have time to get to know God. I'm just easily distracted. You see, Saul's problem was that he started out very focused on who God was, who he was, and what God wanted him to do. Saul got distracted, and it cost him a lot in the midst of his distraction. I wonder what distraction is costing you right now. I wonder what distraction in your life right now, I wonder what price you're paying for distraction. But instead of looking at it and going, this is distraction. Distraction is something I have control over. I can look at that. We're blaming time and saying I don't have time. I wonder, just a question, something for you to think about. Distraction does two things to us. Number one, it starves our focus, which is exactly what it did to Saul. Saul had a focus. Distraction will starve your focus. And the second thing distraction will do is it'll feed your frustration. It'll starve your focus and it will feed your frustration. Yesterday, me and Jackie and Chloe and a few of, our, of Chloe's friends, we went to the Gold Coast. We have this tradition that we do with some friends of ours. It's called the Australia Day Games. And what we do is we get together on Australia Day every year. We meet at a beach at the Gold Coast. They come down from Brisbane. And we have six or seven games that we play, right? And it's like a ring toss. And there's a uh, egg and spoon race where you run you know, 50 metres down the beach with a spoon in your mouth and an egg. There's an egg toss where you see how, what, who, how far apart you can get. And every event has three, two, one points. At the end of the day, you get presented with a coveted Aussie thong trophy. I kid you not. We have a, a, a frame made up with a thong in there and there's plaques from every year. Well, whoever wins it gets their name on a plaque and they get to keep the trophy for the year. We've been doing it since about 2018. By the way, I was the inaugural Australia Day Games winner. I won it. My name's on the plaque. When I was there yesterday, I think I came about 11th or something like that. We don't want to get into that. But I was very distracted yesterday. I was focused on other things. That's why I lost. But um, you, 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 I might not have won yesterday, but no one can take off me. I'm the inaugural Australia Day Games winner winner and that'll never change that's what I said yesterday I was the first number one but we're at the Australia Day Games yesterday and during one of the events we have an event called the uh, Frisbee Volleyball where we've got a little volleyball net and you're broken up into teams of two and you throw the Frisbee over and you've got to catch it before it hits the ground and then wherever you catch it you throw it back and so on and so we were playing a game I had a, 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 a partner my partner was my my excuse me, school friend's daughter, Jessica, and on the opposition was her partner. And so, of course, there was a little bit of sibling, a bit of rivalry going on between the two of them. They're both fairly competitive people. But we were playing against them, and I worked out a tactic, and here's what I did. When I got the Frisbee, I would turn to the referee, and I would look like I was going to say something. When I did, he would turn to his partner to have a conversation. As soon as he turned, I'd go bang, over, down, we won point. And he'd blow up to like, that's not for No, 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 it's in the rules. You know, you got distracted. It wasn't me. I just play in the game. And so he'd pick it up and throw again and so on. Anytime something would happen, I would turn to the referee. And every time I did, he would turn to his partner. And as soon as he turned his back, bang, we beat them 7 1 and gained third place in that particular event. But the point is this later on in the day, in the next event, he was so frustrated. 
You see, he was so frustrated. His, his lack of focus starved him of victory. He didn't win, he lost. And as a result of that, he was so frustrated that he couldn't win that the next game he put so much energy into it that he actually broke his thumb by diving into the leg of another human being and broke his thumb and ended up having to go down to the hospital. And I said, hallelujah, Jesus, thank you. I've been waiting for a sermon illustration. Thank you for that. Oh, gee, that's really bad, buddy. You better get some ice on that. Thank you, Jesus, for a sermon illustration. You better go to the doctor and get that scene too. Thank you, Jesus, for a sermon illustration. He's a man that got so, uh, he lost his focus. And as a result of focus, he was starved of victory. He didn't end up getting where he needed to go because he lost his focus. And what happens when you lose focus in life? You get frustrated. How many of you start the day with a focus and as you get to the end of the day, you haven't achieved whatever that focus was and at the, as the day goes on, you get more and more frustrated because you know you're not hitting the target or the mark. You're not getting where you were focused. You're not going to that place you thought you were gonna go to. And it can happen in a day and then over a week and then over a month and then over a year. And before you know it, we're just constantly frustrated. Because our life lacks focus. And we say things like, I'm pulled here and I'm pulled everywhere and so on. Some of us need to regain focus in our life and get focused on the things that really matter in this human existence. And those things are, who is God to you? What does God say about you? And what did he put you here for? What did he put you here for? The word distraction, it originates from a Latin word and it means this. It, it's a two-part word, dis, which means a part, and tare, tahere, which means drag. So the word distraction literally means this. It's a pulling apart, a separating, a drawing of the mind in different directions, a mental disturbance. How many of you find your mind is being drawn in different directions? directions. You, it happens to us all the time. It could be happening to you right now while you're sitting here. You're sitting here and you're meant to be focusing in on whatever the preacher's saying and the Word of God and trying to listen to the Holy Spirit and how's he uh, applying this to your life, but you're already thinking about your big KFC burger at lunchtime. Or you've been drawn over here and you're thinking about the temperature of the room. It's just too hot. I've got sweat running down my back. I can feel it. Or you're distracted by something else. How easily we get distracted and we lose focus. And distraction is a pulling of the mind. We're meant to be focused over here, thinking about this, looking at that, being this person, but I'm getting pulled over here. And the end result is that I get starved of focus and it just simply feeds frustration in my life. We were created to live a focused life. I plotted a graph on, uh, sorry, I got online, I looked at a graph that plotted the use of the word distraction. And it was amazing that the word distraction was sort of used down here in society. And in 1980, the word distraction has a sharp upward turn and continues to trend upwards as a word that's used commonly. And so I thought, okay, 1980, what happened in 1980? There was a birth of this thing called the internet followed very quickly by the birth of these things called smartphones, mobile devices, followed very quickly by the birthing of this thing called social networking and so on. You know the average person in a day, this is, this is a Business Insider magazine uh, published these results, that the average person touches their mobile phone 2,400 times a day. That's the average person. 2,400 times a day, over here, over to here, doing this, over to that, doing this, over to that. Distraction has become the new normal for humans. It's become the new normal for humans. We're so easily distracted. If you're an extremely distracted person with a mobile device, then you're more upwards of around 5,000 times a day. You touch your phone. We're a distracted generation and a distracted people. But I believe Jesus wants us to be very focused because it's in the midst of focus that you find the most fulfillment and joy. You find the most fulfillment and joy when you live a focused life. Distraction played a role in Saul losing his future. Distraction played a role in David's darkest moment. He's on a roof. He should have been out battling where the kings were. It says at the time when kings went out to battle, David's on his roof. Somehow he was distracted from doing what he was meant to do. He wasn't out fighting. He was at home. And then he sees a beautiful woman and he's distracted again. And he looks over here at a beautiful woman, begins the darkest period 
of David's life because he got distracted. The nation of Israel, read the book of Judges, constantly distracted. We love you, God. We love you, God. Oh, there's some pretty women over there. Let's marry them. Who do you worship? Yeah, we'll have a crack at that. Before you know it, they're distracted again. And they're coming back in and out, in and out, in and out of relationship with God, constantly distracted, losing their focus on who God is, who God says they were, and what they were called to do. In fact, go back to the Garden of Eden. What happened? <laughs> Adam and Eve are sitting there. God says, not good for you to be alone. So God gives Adam, uh, Eve, and they're together, and they've got God, and they're living a focused life. God's even told them what to do. He's given them a job. Tend the garden, look after the place. Sweet, I've got to focus. We know who God is. We know who we are, and we know what we're called to do, and the devil comes along and distorts those things. Did God really say this? Eat this apple, you'll become something better. They got distracted. They lost their focus on what was really, really important. Thus began this human existence focused on who God is, who he says we are, and how he wants us to live. But here's the thing, a focused life begins by getting your life's focus right. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. We'll finish with this. If you want to live a focused life, then you've got to have your life's focus settled. What is your life centered on? What is your life focused on? Is it focused on fame and fortune? Is it focused on attaining the next material possession? That, by the way, might be new to you the day you get it, but in a month's time it's old again. Is it focused on a financial bucket load? And the next time we have a... You know, it's funny, I was talking to someone the other day about finances, and it was amazing. Years and years ago, uh, smart uh, finance people could really uh, predict when there was going to be a massive crash. They could predict ahead and protect their assets and so on. You know, today it happens like that. The smartest people in the world find it hard to predict. And you can lose everything overnight. I don't want to put my, my focus on that. I want to fix my focus on the right things. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. We get a picture of what we should be focused upon. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to just finish with five really simple little things when it comes to do with focus that that verse shows us. Number one, a focused life is possible. It starts off by saying, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. In other words, there are people that have gone before us that have lived a focused life and proven that it can be done. Some of these people face death itself but they remained focused and fixed on who God was, who he said they were, and what he put them here to achieve. They remained focused to the very point of death. I don't know what distractions are there. I reckon if somebody, if I knew somebody could walk in this room right now with a machine gun and take me out because I'm talking to you about Jesus, that would provide ample reason for me to be distracted. But they did it anyway. Somehow they were able to stay undistracted and focus on who God was, who God said they were, and what God put them here to do. So a focused life is possible. Second thing, adjustments are required to live a focused life. It says here that we need to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. Sin, we get it. We understand why we would throw off sin. But it also says just those things that ensnare and slow you down. It's like, an, it's like a boat going through the ocean that's got five anchors hanging out the back and you're going full throttle. Some of you might feel like this. You're going full throttle with the engine, but you know you're not getting anywhere. You're not doing anything wrong, nothing wrong with having an anchor out the back and, and you're going full throttle and so on, but you're dragging too much stuff behind you. You've got to cut some things off so you can actually go and move and be the person that you're meant to be and focus on the things that you know God's placed on your life and, and where he's put you and so on. Focus on that and develop that. Become everything that God wants you to become. It, it's amazing. Sometimes in Christianity, I think we think that God does everything. The reality is God did everything. Now we've got to do some things. We are saved by grace, but we grow through commitment and effort. And that's biblical. It's New Testament Christianity. God's not going to cut off everything. It says you do it. Lay aside the sin and the weights and the things that ensnare you. What is it that's distracting you from going after what God wants for you? Cut it off. Make the choice. Cut it off. Number three, you need to know what your focused life looks like. It says here that you need to run your own race. 
Your race is going to be different to mine. You are a different personality. You've got a different gift mix. You see life differently. You come from different circumstances and situations. And no one can ever stand there and go, this is what it looks like to run the race of faith. I think it's individual for all of us. It's individual for all of us. Sometimes when we talk about, about finding that thing that God wants you to do, everybody instantly goes to a position of be a CEO of the greatest company in the world. Let me tell you something. The CEO of the greatest company in the world couldn't do what he was called to do if he was called to do that if somebody wasn't called to be the person that swept the floors on a Friday night when the lights went out. Somebody's got to feel called to do that and go, that's what I do. Somebody's got to be called to answer the telephones or somebody has to be called to sit in the meeting and just take the notes and do what needs to be done. We all have a part to play in the bigger picture of God and there's no one thing or part of that call or race that runs that's better than any other race. But we've got to find that race that we're called to run within your personality, your gift mix, your circumstances, your situation and also your station in life. Because we've all got a different station in life as well. I wish I had the spare time that Rod's got these days, but I just simply don't. He seems to, all, all I know of Rod is he plays golf every day. Is that right, Elaine? He plays golf every day. And he's really good if you ask him. Really good. He gets distracted and slices or hooks. That's the worst a distraction does for him these days. You need to know what your race is. The next thing, Jesus is actually your example of a focused life. We're told to fix our eyes on him. I, I, a couple of years ago, I gave everybody here a, 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 an assignment. I said, for, for the next two months, don't read anything but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I had people here that did it. I said, just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. When you finish, go back to Matthew. Mark, Luke, John. When you finish, go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's amazing how we read all these other things and we know what Paul said and Peter said and James said and John said, but, but we're, we're, we're still not 100% convinced or remember or know the stuff that Jesus taught. Hey, our faith is based on him. Spend a bit of time in the Gospels. It's a great exercise to do. It, I, I, the feedback, I wish I had have documented the feedback I got from people who did that and the revelations they were getting and the stuff that they said we'd read before but we'd never, ever seen what it was showing us. I'd, I, I'd encourage everybody, why don't you try doing that as a personal thing to get into the words of Jesus. He's our Lord and Saviour and it says he, he's, the, he's the example that we need to fix our eyes upon. And the last one, you need to know your potential distractions and learn to scorn them. Learn to scorn those distractions. It says there that, that Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. Can you imagine being Jesus? There would have been a lot of things to be distracted by. And in fact, there were a lot of things to be distracted by on the way to fulfilling what he was called to do. How many of you know the stories where he's in town and basically what we would today call a revival is breaking out. People are being healed, delivered. It's revival. And then the disciples want to stay there. And Jesus goes, no, we're going to go to the next town. Hang on a second, man. You could set up your ministry headquarters here. You could charge a subscription fee. We could make a mint. We could make a huge difference. You could run for prime minister. And Jesus goes, no, I've got to keep moving because I'm focused. I know what I'm about. And it's not about the fame, the fortune. It's about knowing what I'm called to do and just chipping away and doing it. And so he did that. But it's interesting, that word scorn, where it says that he scorned the shame. He scorned the shame of the cross. It literally means this. He despised, he disdained, you think little or nothing of. In other words, Jesus thought nothing of the shame. Other people might go, oh, the shame. It's... Jesus thought nothing of it. And some of us in this room, you need to learn to think of those distractions as nothing. Part of the problem with distraction is we think too highly of that thing. That's why it's a distraction. We've got to start thinking less of that thing and more of our focus. And that is that we are called of God, loved by God, put on this earth to display the goodness and the reality of God to a world that at this moment are struggling to see him. And as time goes on, their vision of him is getting more and more blurred. And unless people stand up and start to refocus, unless the church refocuses, we are getting pulled to pillar and post as well at the moment with all kinds of wind of doctrine and all kinds of teaching. Let's get our eyes back on Jesus and let's be people of focus. Amen. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word. God, thank you for uh, the opportunity to worship together. And God, I just pray for each person in this room, Lord. Uh, God, your word is like a seed and it goes into the soil and we all know the parable of the soil. And God, let, let, let the soil of our hearts be one where it takes root, gets fertilized and it has time to grow and to flourish. So Father, bless uh, everybody in this place as they go from here this morning, Lord. Seal what you're speaking to them, Holy Spirit. Father, if they've got questions, I pray, motivate them to go and talk to someone. Go and ask. Go and get prayer. Don't just move on. 
like a processing plant to the next thing. And Father, in the next seven days as we leave this place, God, I pray for each person here, each person that's bowed their knee to you, God, would you give us an opportunity to tell somebody out there about your goodness and how much you love them, God. Somebody out there today that's struggling, that doesn't know how much you care for them, that doesn't know that you're real, that needs to hear that message. Father, give us the opportunity, the invitation this week to take that message to those people. We ask that in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Bless you guys.